This is uh, Robert Stark. I'm joined here with uh, Pillator. We're going to be discussing the manga uh, Kazi to Kino Uta, the poem of the wind in the trees. Uh, Pillator, great talking to you. Nice talking to you, Robert. This is actually um, the third time we've actually had a one-on-one and just actually talking as I'm actually the subject instead of being the co-host most of the time. So yeah, this is going to be interesting. It's funny is because on a lot of our previous shows, like you're really into a manga anime, and you keep talking about using this word yaoi, and I, got, well, I, I wasn't quite sure what you were talking about. It's, but then I, I looked at the, uh, up on Wikipedia and found out what yaoi was. It's one of those things you know when you're like 15 or 16 if you were reading manga, but if case of the audience don't know, yaoi is basically a boy love genre targeted to girls where it's just handsome men that just like kiss and get really close to one another. It just Oh, it's more to girl. Yeah, I read the, the on the Wikipedia description, the audience is mostly female cuz you would assume it would be sort of oriented towards gay men. Yeah. You know, like the thing is, yeah, I mean gay men do read it. They just keep it like a secret about it. And there has been some openly gay Well, the thing is like it's kind of like a cliche uh, that, that that straight men are into, like, lesbian porn. And there are women who are turned on by a gay st- gay men, or men engaging in erotic behavior, but it's more of a niche. Like, I, I, it's not something you think about as being as widespread. But apparently this yaoi stuff, it's more of a female fan base than male. It's like shoujo. Shoujo is literally for girls. And, if you, and like, they always tell Japanese men if they want to know more about the nature of Japanese women, just pick up a shoujo and understand their nature. Even read yaoi to understand how to be a better man. I know that sounds kind of funny. Why would you self-improve yourself reading a yaoi? It actually has a subversive effect and uh, can work real well on it. So, I mean, I've read a lot of shoujo before, um... Can you explain what a sojo is to our audience? It's basically um, a girl's uh, manga. And it's like, it's. I'm thinking of Ashite Night. It's this one, um, uh, probably from like, it was from the 80s. And it's basically about the girl's life, what she does. There's always a love interest. And the man is like really handsome and attractive. And um, oh, I had these one manga series before. I think it was by Rari Takada. I think it was Punch. And basically, she was interested in this boxer who's like evil and cruel. But at the same time, this guy does love her and stuff. I think she also did Happy Hustle High. Well, this is just something, I think Tokyo Pop or one of those made an English translation of it. But if you look at a shoujo, it just basically means like it's about the girl and about her interest. And it's funny because we hear this stuff in the alt right about game, right? About how this is, you must follow, like, Rouge V's game theory, and then you can pick up a girl. When, like, if you just read these, like, English-translated mangas, you can really learn about the girl's nature, and maybe men want to intimidate being this sexy, intimidating y- yaoi character, you know? And there is some wisdom to shoujo and even yaoi on that matter. And with the Kaze to Kino Uta, I watched it for the first time last night, and I, uh, I listened to your advice... I, I turned off my lights and I watched it in the dark. My documentary? <laughs> no, the the film. But I, I'm, oh. I saw like the first uh, 12 minutes of your documentary, but I didn't finish the film itself. I watched it about four weeks ago, and I found it through, I think, Alex Su. Um, she who was doing fan art for Patelio, um, She I think she had it in her feed, and I just notice while skimming through the youtube video it takes place in this old victorian place a college on the hill and it just had this strange aesthetic to it and you know it wasn't boy girl love it was boy boy love and this kind of romantic thing and i felt really nostalgic about it and i felt was putting my own life into uh kaze to ki no uta and I i watched it in the dark in my bedroom on my laptop and loved it and i feel like you know, this would be so much better if I could just watch this in a movie theater in Philadelphia, especially at like a midnight showing. That would be such a powerful art house film. And so 
I think it was so powerful. I had to made a, a documentary about it. And I uploaded it on my YouTube channel and talked about all the sexual things uh, in Kaze Toki no Uta. It's amazing too that this work is one of the first yaois ever. It's actually – Oh, I thought you said Padalero was the first yaoi. Is Padalero a yaoi? Yeah, Padalero too. It was a part of that same movement, right? They both came from like the mid-70s. There was kind of a group of people, the uh, Year 24 group, and uh, people like Kieko Takimiya and Minio Maya were a part of that where, you know, it was like girls' comics and men and boy-on-boy love and taking sexuality to this strange place – that the Japanese were being more open well, and graphic about it. Kazeku, Kazetuki no Uta, there was the anime, a film that came out. Was there, was it a illustration prior to that? Well, it was a manga before. I haven't, I only skimly through looked the manga. It looked really interesting. But I've only watched the film right now, but I'm super interested now in the manga. And next time when I'm at the Japanese bookstore, I'll definitely look in the Japanese aisle and pick up a, a raw copy of it. I mean, I will say this. Um, I took Asian studies like for two and a half years at when I first was going in college. And at that time, I was exposed to a lot of anime film in theater. Another film I really liked, which was a shoujo, was Aim for the Ace. I think Aim for the Ace is a very pretty girl's uh it's an anime and also a manga, too. I've read a bit of the manga, but the anime is just very powerful. It's like watercolors about a girl's life being overrun by a big fascist tennis uh, racket man or something like coach, you know? And it's the struggle about Japanese society in the mid-70s. Along with Chi the Brat, I really loved. Um, that was another anime film I, I remember seeing in my sophomore year in Asian studies. And I really love that. It has the same powerful aesthetics like watching Akira. I know Akira is more well-known in the West. Chi the Brat and Aim for the Ace are lesser knowns, but still have a very powerful backdrop in the tradition of anime films. And it does seem there's this, like, uh, avant-garde type uh, mangas, and you see it with uh, European films from that era, like the 70s and 80s, and we'll get to that later. But there was never really anything like this uh, in American culture, like no equivalents. You know, we could say Larry Clark's Kids already worked by Harmony Korine in the surreal avant-garde sense. I mean, everyone likes the Goonies, and we talk about kids running through that, but then we use methods of deconstruction We could say that there's a sexual interest in that. However, I know what you're saying. As if the Japanese... Wait, how would you make that case for the Goonies? (laughs) Maybe because they're all a bunch of young boys going to... It's a coming-to-age story. It's like that silly Stephen uh, King movie, uh, The Stand, right? Oh, yeah. They find a dead body, but it's just a bunch of gay little young boys about a fireplace and talking. What kind of boys talk, right? The same as I'm just making a loose thing about Goonies. It sounds so surreal. Why would you ever be a pervert and assume that, you know? And so... Well, this gets back to the whole, if you listen to the show we did with uh, James O'Mara, where he has this whole concept of, like, the men are booned, and how uh, our culture, that's sort of equated with uh, homosexuality. Yeah, I I know what you're talking about. and I like men who are aesthetically pleasing, you know, especially if they have Adonis chest you know, and clean cut, tall and nice. I mean, there's some beauty to that man. However, we don't have American men like that anymore. We have this kind of fat culture where everyone stays at home, plays video games, works a terrible job, lives out in a state nobody cares about, and it's just grotesque is a better word. And I feel like maybe people should just work out, eat healthy, and do cool things like, um, you know, and then maybe the gay club, is not filled with furry, anime-loving fat kids instead of big... I wish yaoi men were in the gay club, but it's not like that, and, you know... No, they don't look like Gilbert. <laughs> yeah, they don't look like Gilbert. Gilbert I literally saw is... The, yeah? I saw the first scene where Gilbert was having sex with an older man in the greenhouse, and he's very adro- androgynous. Like, I thought he, he looks like a... A young girl, very much so. Like, I originally thought Gilbert was a female character at first. I mean, I sort of knew from talking about this, but if I knew nothing about the background of the 
of the film, I would have assumed Gilbert was a female who was a flat-chested. They do this often in these yaois and shoujo animes, where it's a voice actress doing the role of a guy character that looks like a woman, right? They do the same thing in Padaloo with Maraki, right? So I keep constantly calling Gilbert a she, and it literally is a girl replace her tits and vagina with a small penis and a nice twink body. But he does, get- oh, but he, the thing that's funny is there's a scene towards the end where they're... It's a very surreal scene where they're floating in space together naked, but you just... In the genital area, like, they just show, like, this uh, blank uh, skin area. They, I know they do that a lot in cartoons. Yes. That's so funny. It's a very romantic ending. I mean... Doesn't it- Gilbert uh, die in the end? Yes, in the, the manga he does, and they foreshadow it in the anime. And but the he, anime, yeah, they kind of foreshadow it, but they're vague. They're vague about it. Because you have to remember, in the anime, Sergei is all, like, I think he's in his mid-20s. He's back on the campus, looking back at his, maybe he's even older, but looking back You're on his You're talking about the first scene where Sergei uh, comes to the campus, and it's kind of vac- uh, vacant. Yeah, and then after that, the last scene you have to remember this is all just a memory he's having of his younger self and at the very end of the film he remembers seeing gilbert walking along and saying that i was like the wind and you were like the trees hence why it's called you know the poem of the wind of the trees and it's rather just a, a, fantas- a fantasizing about no one believing your youthful background right it's not like um i can't tell you my youth i'm still pretty young myself and probably i might go through the post-youth phase however I can't really say what happened to me at the ages of 18 to 22. I can't, I, I'm almost at the cusp of the end of that, but still. You didn't have anyone like Gilbert in your life? Unfortunately, no. It was just a bunch of relationships with many different Asian girls and getting very close to them. And I have yet to write that in my own book, but still. Couldn't you have uh, con- convinced them to dye their hair blonde and pretend they're Gilbert? I've never, I never <laughs> met a blonde Asian girl before, so, uh. <laughs> And that's kind of crazy, but I don't know. <laughs> well, there's that scene in the in the isn't the scene in the greenhouse? He's a prostitute, but it gets very sensual. He's commenting on his like smooth white skin, and then the other the older man goes down on him. Yeah, Jack goes down on him, and he basically uses his prostitute money to buy exams to get through it because he's also from he's like the bad boy, right? Even in when he gets his grades, they tell him the one kid raises his pinky and he's like, ah, oh, he's a fag. That's like a Japanese way of saying. It's weird because later on, too, all the boys are like, oh, Gilbert tries to seduce me, too, as if there's <laughs> a strange homosexuality going on through it. So nobody's really innocent, right? Everyone is kind of in this boy love fantasy that teases the audience, this Japanese audience. But we can clearly see how the film has power over us. Especially with Lassie Nielsen's work, he does the same thing in You Are Not Alone. Lassie Nielsen's film, You Are Not Alone, is basically about a coming-to-age story that might be a silly 80s or even earlier 70s piece. 70s, yeah. Of just, like, trying to belong. But we, the, the thing about Nielsen is he has this interesting homoerotic, even pedophilia nature he's criticized on. I mean, he's certainly obsessed with the child figure. On his YouTube channel... In the past, well, all his films are basically about that same theme. He's in love with that aesthetic, as if it's internal youth. Um, there's this one film he has on his YouTube channel of just little kids playing handball, how young and energetic they are. Or even his uh, trip to the, I think, Thailand, too. Um, there's, like, these young kids. Oh, and, uh, he made some film. It's it's sort of similar to Lord of the... like. Uh, Lord of the Flies. Yeah. I love I forget, his... A- I forget the name of it, but it's about these uh, young, like, uh, teens who were, on it, who were, like, stuck on a deserted island. I love his 8mm films. I think they're the most powerful films, um, especially Home Alone Home. It's just a little boy being bored, playing card games, jerking off, making food. I mean, he even has The More We Are Together, just kids in, like, Denmark having fun. Right, and just like in the the echoing green, which William Blake likes to fantasize a lot about, those eight millimeter films seem like it's a time machine in an age where it's just a single group of people 
are all harmonizing and getting together and belong to a certain race or a type of people. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, really. And um, I think Nielsen is focusing on that. However, it's quite evident that he might be in love with it too much, and it comes weird as like a weird pedophile, or his quote-unquote films are rather just him um, getting his weird pedophile nature across. I mean, there are a lot of YouTube commenters on our film oh, that are yeah. like, I've seen those. they're really dirty, where it's like, oh, I wish the only thing is... Oh, they're either really like saying, oh man, I'm really into this, or they're like condemning them. Like, I'm really outraged, you're really sick, you're a real sicko, and you get on, both comments. On deleted scenes, my brother, son, whatever, this is my nephew, one guy writes, cute boy, but Speedos would do much better. Next one, wish he was nude. Cute boy would love to see him naked. Naked boys are the best. <laughs> should be nude and the guys are named spanking man right and then here's here's the weird part this youtuber says prince something 11 months ago writes i love this boy paul tebbit writes back you're a nice looking guy by the way how old are you and where do you live that's some creepy stuff going on i mean these are from older guys too and it's on nielsen's youtube channel and he's not commenting on them and what, the, is that his personal youtube channel or a fan youtube channel this is, i think it might be his official youtube channel too um, smile, my new friend. Kiss you. The thing about Nielsen's film is they're more about innocence. Like, I think uh, Kaze to Kino Uta is more, definitely more disturbing. Well, it's disturbing in the fact that it's about pain on Gilbert's side. But Sergei, him being his normal self, is taming Gilbert, and they both love each other. Something that never really happened. If you wanted to use game theory, you could say Sergey is a beta, right? And Gilbert is the alpha sexy guy. And it's a cute love story between the beta and the alpha, right? But it, it never really happens that way. And it's also teasing those themes too, right? Something like there's the popular kids and the kids that get pushed around. And Kaze Tuki no Uta. Oh, yeah. In your documentary about Kaze Tuki no Uta, you use the term normie. Yes, they're normies, right? There's the whole group of just kids we don't care about who are in this two semesters of their high school experience. It sounds more like a college, but in their high school experience, they they you know they live on campus, they do these things, they don't care. They just want to get past and get a grade and move on with life. However, all this stuff is going down. This huge love, the meaning of life, that Sergey's most important part of his life is now, and it's like it's going to haunt him for his whole career as a pianist, like some weird sexual, like he was raped or something, you know? It's it's strange. It's very much like akin to Norwegian Wood by Murakami, or maybe Yukio Mishima's Confessions of a Mask. It seems to have that tradition in Japanese. Can you talk movie. about what happens in, in Yukio uh, Mishima's uh, Confessions of a Mask? In Confessions of a Mask, it really details Mishima's life up until he was 24, uh, I think he wrote it when he was, like, late 23. And it's just a published. story featured in the film The Life in uh, Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. It's my favorite, one of my favorite novels, too, because he presents himself as a boy and as where he is today. Now, if you compare that with Elliot Rogers' My Twisted World, obviously Elliot Rogers kills everyone, and I don't mean to compare I it with that. I saw the film A Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters, and it did does remind me of some as attributes of a uh, of a uh, Rogers. Now in Mishima's work, Mishima's work, um, you have this kind of. He starts out as a kid, you know, remembering when he was taking a shower in the sink. You know, there's this one part where he wanted to dress up as a girl, but his mom would beat him and say, "No, you don't do that," and he would cry, saying, "Why can't you be pretty?" Right? There's other parts too where he's looking through a book. And it's like he's looking at this powerful figure. Wow, who's that? That's Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, why is she a woman? Why is she doing such a thing? And then there's the famous part, uh, Oni, where he's at school. It's snowing. He's he's walking in the snow with this big bully kid named uh, Oni. Everyone's scared of him. But he has special treatment with the little weak Yukio. And so there's this game that they play where they push them on this little horsey thing. And then it's his turn with on the pushy thing. But he's really good at the game, Yukio. But Oni is mad because he can't get him off. But he doesn't want to get him off, and Yukio assumes that they both love each other, and hence creates his first gay 
uh, sexual interest in a big, overwhelming man that takes him. Everyone knew that that was his best friend, and he assumes this gay pedophilia love as well. And there's also the part, the famous part, which is always a reference, of him masturbating with fluffy white cloud sperm about St. Sebastian. And later, Mishima and his life would look like St. Sebastian. And there's also his love, that he tries to like girls, but he can't. It's very similar to my own life, where I can't, like, well, I don't make to make any radical assumptions, but I feel that white girls I have dated in the past, I feel that same Mishima effect where I really am associated with someone inner words myself, and I do like Asian girls, is um, maybe for the same reason Mishima liked more of his homosexuality nature. He wrote Forbidden Colors, talking about the struggles of being married and having still a homosexual interest. It's like me, you know, right? If I associate with white nationalism and stuff like that, I still like Asian girls, right? It's really hard to like that white Aryan girl in the field and still go on with that. When really, I think Asian women have such kind hearts and were kindest to me. I mean, I don't mean to say it's like some dysfunction or degenerate thing anyway. I just wish white girls would be better and understand that we live through a degenerate times or some kind of period that's really crazy on their side. With uh, Kaze Tuki no Uta, who's the name of the... There's another character who comes in, I forget his name, but he's the one who uh, rapes uh, Gilbert. There's Max. There's Max yes, and Max. Jax. And Max and Jax, okay. Max and Jax, and then there's also a Pascal. Pascal's the cute kid with the brown hair that likes science, and he does... Uh, <laughs> he does the... Um, he blows air in his mouth, and there's this one sexual scene in the early... But yeah... Jack is like the the cool bad guy with the blue hair, and he's like, that's how he is. Oh, yeah. You know, he's the cool alpha guy who bullies Sergei around. And then there's Max, who's like the pimp daddy, who still likes him. I mean, even at the end, uh, Gilbert has his love for his father, but his father is a tormented soul that just wants to use him as a product. And it shows that it's an abusive relationship. And so, like text messaging on a phone with someone you really like, especially coming from your father, that's going to make real hardcore daddy issues. And, uh, you know, it, it, he, he tries to find love with Max, and then there's a scene at Christmas Mass being outside, and he wants Max to rape him and kill him and do all this stuff to him because he can't, it's so hard for his reality that he doesn't have any love, you know, for him. And um, it, it, it's... um. It's, it's strange, because it's really sophisticated, the background, especially in the manga, Takaze Toki no Uta. I mean, there's certainly a lot of crazy stuff going on from Desaad's work and uh, other things, almost erotic work of nature. And this is coming from a Japanese. I mean, something this reminds me of Yukio Mishima's Madame de Desaad, where this is coming from the the wife of the sod it's an all women play you could say that some it's madame de uh madame de sod um it was a play and uh there was a one translated work by donald keen and um all women are in it and they talk about this disgusting thing that's going on from the perspective of de sod's wife but they never really address the issue it's really a How classic did they depict de sod in that the wife says that de sod he looks sinister at first but really cute and she's always defending him and he there's this one part where he shoots a rabbit and then he tears the rabbit's heart open and shows his wife and says that it's like the blood of wine that life is so fragile and i could get it still beating like my love for you and then he does there's, other... isn't there some line in uh kaze to kino Uta where one of the characters i forget which one says like about pain and about the beauty of both pain and pleasure, and that's totally out of Tassad. Yeah, his, the Gilbert's father. Who oh, that's Gilbert's father. He's basically using him and telling the instructor at the, the school that Gilbert is like an experiment, some pet project where he's going to be used to um, use him for some strange, you know, I, I don't really know the background of it, but it seems so whimsical that it becomes like, drama nobody would actually ever do this i mean it, it seems to me that it, he's living a hard harsh life gilbert and like it's going to be sergey that's going to rescue gilbert from his misery 
You were uh, commenting on uh, Lassa Nielsen, and I was kind of thinking what the characters in one of the films. Oh, I think it's um, the one Mosca Kuvi. Uh, could we maybe? It looks just like Gilbert. Yeah, the blonde-haired kids. I mean, the sexy blonde-haired. You know, that underage. You know, when you are not alone, that underage scene where two boys of fifteen, sixteen are hugging each other, right? And then this one, they, there's some girl action, uh, boy girl action. But well, Monster all- QV is actually what's interesting about that film is it's primarily the character is heterosexual and his love interest is a girl, but at the same time you can tell that the film it, that the film is coming from that direction of like homosexuality, even though the film itself is is a, is a heterosexual. I mean, just the cinematography, like what it focuses on. It's like the locker room scene, right? All the boys oh, yeah. in the locker room. The same thing in Kazeto Kino Uta, where Sergei's in the locker room and Gilbert sexily, slow motion, takes off his chest and he's like, mm, what are you looking at? No boys are in here. And he tells him how much, he plays him like a harp. You're a dangerous harp I want to play. So much attention is on shirtless boys. You have to think about that. Are you sure that's deliberate homosexual interest, or is this this is what actually happens in boys' locker rooms, and this is an aesthetic nobody's really a talking about, and something that's a beauty in life? And there's this uh, photographer, uh, Will McBride, and I I found out about him because you mentioned uh, Peter Sotos, and Peter Sotos wrote about him, but he has this uh, art book called Salem uh, Suite, which takes place at a boarding school in uh, – he did in a boarding school in Germany. It's an art book, but it does remind me a lot of uh, Katsei Tuniko Uta. Like there's a photograph of this boy playing piano. Yeah. McBride is certainly interested in the whole youth thing too, and it's very similar. Also probably coming from that 70s period as well. His book- All this stuff was from the 70s and 80s, which is uh, – there's – I don't know what it is about that era because before that, I guess people were very more discreet about expressing themselves. But then our society has changed a lot since then. But there is something kind of unique about the 70s and 80s that produced all this avant-garde work. Probably because it was the start of the baby boomer generations. And those baby boomers were in this strange mid to 20s to 30s age range and they were getting these positions of power and being more experimental from the modernist tradition where they were changing tradition and coming off from like you know T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound and creating this rather more decadent thing but at the same time however it was mostly a white country and it was all white people doing these things and their concepts like multicultural and diversity were up and coming in new things and they thought that you would get maximum freedom and liberty to do these artistic things and so I think that's why the art was much more, as you want to call it, degenerate. Because they didn't think it was degenerate, because everything else was healthy. They just were pushing the boundaries of what was considered traditional. And they're artists, and they'll do what they want. Peter Sotos uh, talked about uh, Will McBride. What specifically was, was Sotos uh, referring to? Sotos, in his book, Selfish Little, he talks about a book called Show Me. It was by Will McBride. It was a really, it was really like a sex education book, and the thing though is they used kids, like a little boy and a little girl, to do sex positions, and rather it was borderline child pornography, and people, it, it showed that and maybe helped make people more interested in that pedophilia interest, and so you have to, you have to know that that's a little too much. Sotos, in his context, were talking about all the freaks and the, the namble of pedophile guys that you show me to get their perverted interest across. In that same book, however, Sotos was actually talking about the child pornography trade in Japan. If you go to these, um, lo- uh, you know, these lolly lolly places that show like underage anime hangtai girls and mangas, some of the Japanese, it's all written in it and shows a catalog of what pretty girls you want to see. Then the names become English, like Emily and Sarah, and they're literally pictures of like little naked girls on the beach. Not in sexual position, but the aesthetic wise of these things. And I guess these old Japanese men jerk off to that stuff, but still, it's this strange thing Peter Sotos is trying to uncover 
through this weird child I court heard market. there was even a uh, Supreme Court uh, ruling on that top on the on the Lollicon. Yeah, you know, Japan is certainly different from America, and our well, interest. Someone in- did get. I heard someone got arrested taking uh, magazines of that from Japan into Canada. I think United States is weird because the Supreme Court ruled it was free speech, but uh, different states have different laws about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's weird. It's certainly two different cultures are clashing. The American version of sexuality, we think of our big tit, blonde haired Hooters girl, and the Japanese sexuality can be anything from a geisha maid to a little kid. They seem to be obsessed with the A cup little kids with black hair. Or anything from dark-skinned uh, uh, prostitutes with blonde hair, which I'm very uh, fond of. I think they're super pretty street kind of gongoro girls. I think that's awesome. But it, it's weird sexuality. It, it's definitely something that um, should be more talked about and why these little trends develop. Maybe because people are bored with life. Maybe they encountered someone who are the love of their life and they find – and they're a confusing love with sex. And maybe they want to masturbate all the time and feel in love over and over again, like a drug. Maybe it's an experience, like at a certain age, that people have, like they they have their first crush or they first fall in love, and I guess people do get mentally kind of focused in that stage in life. I can I, totally and, understand. <laughs> you see that kind of theme of wanting like eternal youth. Um. Yeah, especially in Nielsen's film. I don't know what maybe Nielsen has been around at all-white Scandinavian country and probably has uh, experienced that himself. I don't know what, but he he seems to be likes the boy figure a lot as maybe like a cherry blossom you always like have your I, youth. My high school, uh, I went to a high school that was like very kind of uh, very ghetto, very diverse, and uh, my locker room's experiences were nothing like that. <laughs> I know, right? You always wish those locker rooms. I mean, <laughs> I had strange locker room experiences. I mean, I literally had guys in the room being like wiggling their dicks at each other, saying like, "I had the bigger dick. I have this." Or then they'll talk. Then they'll try to make a non-gay My room. We didn't. They didn't even. We didn't even. Ha- we didn't even have a shower. It was just the shower was just like abandoned and hadn't been used since like th- in thirty years. Like, the guys will wiggle their dicks at one another, and then they'll be like, oh, we'll watch this. I could pull down his pants and rape him in there, and I could just show how dominant I am. Like, dude, what is that, gay? No, it just means I'm dominant over him. It's only gay when he doesn't want to take it in. You know, it's like this strange, I don't know, boy humor in high school is really funny and convoluted. Kind of like that scene, the locker room scene in uh, Moscow, Moscow. Kuvi. Yeah, and the same with just looking at Gilbert taking off his clothes and how you're friends, I'm friends, you know. There's something interesting about that. You know, I'm trying to think of this one family film from, like, the 90s. It was, like, this kid and this panda. It was a PG film. The love interest in that was a Chinese girl, and then she comes out of the river all naked. It's a very... Oh, is it live action? Yes, it is. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I remember seeing that film, but... I don't remember the name. It's like a kid on with a panda. They're crossing a bridge. And then the PG moment, it's this Chinese girl that comes up all nude. Is, and it's is like, that the moment where you became an Asianarian? You know, we have that film on VHS somewhere. And uh, I think my family still has it in the basement somewhere. And I could actually go and check. Um, but I barely remember that film. But, there was some Japanese film uh, from the 80s, and uh, someone posted a clip on uh, YouTube, but it got deleted for n- violating nudity policies on YouTube. But what happened is – I don't know the name of the movie because it was all in Japanese, but there were all these uh, men in traditional Japanese gown. And then this uh, beautiful, like, curvy, naked woman woman comes up out of, the, out of like, this, like, lake swimming, and they were all just there, like, uh, like all excited and – yeah, I mean, there's a lot of those films. Is it The Amazing Panda Adventure? The Amazing Panda Adventure. I'm going to look that up really quick. Yes, it's The Amazing oh! Panda Adventure. It is The Amazing Panda Adventure. I should do a review on that. That is, oh my god, any kid, any white kid in 95 growing up and you're five years old or six years old and then you see like that naked 
beautiful Chinese girl. Yeah, Robert. Well, you're a lot younger here. than I remember seeing that film. I was probably maybe like about ten. Oh, I saw. I was, I was. I don't even remember it. I'm like. I was like only like three or something. But I remember seeing it much later on after '95, like the late '90s, seeing it. And like, it is... oh, it's a scene. Oh, is it the scene? There's a scene where they get like leeches on them in, in the river. Probably. You know, I'm just googling searches right now. Oh yeah. Probably, but it's like, oh my god, it's like it's definitely a white male Asian female fest movie. Funny, I should definitely do a review on that, which is funny. You definitely should. And then there's this, there's this other Japanese photographer, Garo Ida. Are you familiar with Garo Ida? I mean, he's really interested in very young girls, and yeah, it could be. You could say it's a Japanese thing, but there's all these other photographers like Will McBride. And then there's uh, David Hamilton and Jock Sturges. Yeah, there is a uh, photo magazine from 1986, the June issue. It's a French magazine. It features the work of Ida on it. It seems to be very three young Japanese girls kissing each other. Somebody bought it for like 30 euro. But, you know, Ida is interesting. I mean, I, I don't know what really to say about him. Other than that, um, this must be a Japanese artist known for his gra- graphic work. He, he certainly took a lot of photographs of very younger girls, which are um, uh, controversial, especially if you're outside of Japan. But this is pretty common in the Japanese context of them just taking pictures of girls. I mean, very young girls, too. Uh, the classical black-haired, slim, A-cup body it seems to be a very popular thing. But, kind of the um, polar opposite of the Gangaroo. Oh yeah, the big thick girls who are like who are like they want to be black. They have but they want to only suck white men's dick and huh. they want to be Americanized. That's their. And then of there's those girl. other Japanese erotic illustrators that I sent you. Yeah, I there's... think one of them was one of them used in a Brad Sinclair uh, music video. Um. Well, Hajima uh, Hajima Soirayama was um, did the famous heavy metal metallical woman. Uh, I think Brat Sinclair in his um, Hyper Techno series, um, the volumes, he uses that woman as to um, the robotic woman, uses it as the front cover. Oh, but, yeah, um, that's a robotic one. Yeah, yeah i seen this robot, this Soriyama robot woman. Is this Hajime Soriyama? Yep, Soriyama. Soriyama, you know, you see that all over, the, the, the Sony robot pet thing. You'll see it in these cheesy, like, glam rock things, and... Um, yeah, this the, I remember seeing that robot all everywhere. It's just one of those things. It's like the um, it's like Max Headroom, right? Max Headroom being that like graphical monster thing. Isn't he kind of vaporwave? Yeah, that's the thing. And Soriyama's metal thing would probably be in the vaporwave context of this cheesy '80s perfected woman. You know, it's 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 strange, right? It, it, it's corporate, but it's a part of our history. Then you also sold me um. Namio Furukawa. Um, she was, um, or he, I- I'm not so sure. From what I'm seeing, it's these pictures of these really fat Japanese women doing very BDSM, BDSM things, sitting on people's faces, smoking cigarettes, just like funny stuff. And you're thinking, is this erotic art or is this fine art? You know, um, it seems to be that. He likes that kind of. Uh, you Usually, know, you don't wander. see Japanese women with that body type. No, this guy's pretty old too. He's he was born in 1947, right? And so obviously he knows the whole avant-garde stuff, and um, he he he's interesting. I mean, I just I just don't know much about him. It just seems like his erotic art would definitely for that punker scene of kids who just like love offensive shock art. Yeah, at the same time, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure he, he has a fine art interest, what, he's, what he does and how he thinks about things. I mean, there's also a Tumblr called uh, Fuck Yeah Namio Hurukawa uh, and just pictures of that. It's this strange kind of, uh, yeah, there's a fine line between art and erotic art, what, the, what we get out of it. So, or what defines art and erotica? Because that, that kind of gets to that debate with photography because the goal of erotica is to give someone erotic pleasure, and the goal of art 
is to aesthetic. Ex- is the aesthetic, but erotic. But if something is aesthetically stimulating, that stimulates a person erotically and gives them sexual erotic pleasure. So it's it's very much it's it's difficult to define, and that was kind of the debate like we the, with these photographers like uh, Garo Ida, uh, filmmakers like Glossa Nielsen, uh, Will McBride, uh, David Hamilton, Jock Sturgis. They were able to get away with what they did to a degree. I mean, obviously, it's from a legal standpoint because their stuff was classified as art. But as you said, there is this like ongoing debate about what is art and what is erotica. And you really can't. There isn't a clear definition. You know, it's... Okay, well, there's also David Hamilton's work. Um, David Hamilton is very similar to um, McBride in a way. That his subjects, you know, he's Western, so he comes from that background. And uh, Hamilton is 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 more about the beauty of the girl figure. She's kind of probably at seventeen or later. Um, a lot of that whole like um, Raph, pre-Raphaelite Raphaelite phase, that kind of. 1850 uh, or that, that that certain aesthetic where you had that white girl in the Aryan field kind of thing. The beauty of that European figure she's more about. And um, it could be erotic, but at the same time, it's not like you're going to masturbate to it. It's as if you know someone like this in that kind of culture where it was. Or that there's this um, thing to it that he, he, he's showing that there's a power in the figure of of the girl, the young girl, you know. Yeah, they're done, uh, most of them were done in the 80s, but they have the feeling of, like, the old master's paintings from, like, the 18th century. Yes, I mean, to think of people more as in realistic in terms, and um, there's an interesting, when I think of French women, right, French women seem to be, I have this joke, right, uh, French women, they're, they're, they're often, there's this, this sexy cliche, right? They're, they're sexy because they speak in French. You know, they speak in this sexy language and that French women have these, they don't have boobs, they're A cups, and they're very similar to the Japanese, the French. Like, I'm talking about pure French, right? They don't know any English. And there's always this love that you're going to find a French lover and they, they, they don't shave. They do these really rural things, right? And so... And that's also true of a Jap- uh, stereotype of Japanese women. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm saying is that the French on the white side are like the most submissive European women. And the Japanese on the Asian side seem to be the most submissive. But both have grand art and nature to them. So looking at this one David Hamilton, like they're all in ballet class, but one is naked, one's dancing. This is the motherly nature of what these French white women do. What they uh, dance and they go around and kind of like um, Japanese doing a, 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 um, a kabuki play or something, going into your culture and understanding where there's some there's What's some ironic about, the, about this is there's something very like traditional uh, European about it, but when there was a push for censorship, it was mostly uh, from these like religious right types and like a lot of southern states tried to push to ban it. That yeah, it's so it's ironic. I mean, I remember as a as a teenager, you you could find those books at like Barnes and Noble, but and now Barnes and Noble they've obviously went out of business. But there was a push by like these religious right types to get those books banned. Yes, it's even the whole multicultural and diverse paradigm, as if you got to be more open about other things than being white, right? You had to. Um, well, I think because I think it is. That's, I mean, that's kind of part of a Western civilization. Yeah, I mean, like, this ideal, too, that's pedophilia in nature, that somehow in the Christian notion, you grow up, you commit guilt, you can't be innocent anymore, and you gotta do adult duties and responsibilities, which is really strange and foolish, as if at a certain age you must do something. First, it has to be personal growth before you can do anything like that. And so... It, history has been weird in the past 50 years of the American situation and the world. And so I think when when there's new people in the world, they'll have a new – they'll have to rethink about the world over and over again, right? The baby boomers are almost dead. Their paradigm is going to be over with. Millennials and Gen X, the Gen Xers are kind of getting in power now. But the millennials are coming in. It's this whole red-pilling notion, 
about indoctrinating with new realities of the world, right? Where it's this, this, it's no longer attachment to things like neo-Nazism or Auschwitz, right? That it's somehow, kind of in a sense like starting from scratch. Yeah, and because so, like the older generation, they have these rigid ideas of what the the society was like when they were growing up. And what conservatism is, or if they're a uh, liberal baby boomer, what the hippie era was. But with people like uh, our generation, I mean, you're significantly younger than me, but we're still from kind of the same generation. We're sort of a product of what I guess some people might describe as liberalism or modernity. But that, in a sense, also gives us the freedom to start from scratch and to come up with our own visions. That's exactly what I'm saying. It's being going to be so new where we forget even why the foundation was even made. And so we're going to have to throw away like every French critical theorist we have ever heard and reestablish the academia or institution or just throw away academia altogether. It's, it's strange because history is like that. And according to David Hamilton and all these photographers were mentioned, we'd have to also reconstruct how we think about sexuality. What do we like and what is promoting it and how do we feel? You know, it's this strange... I see that in a sense the aesthetic is – it's kind of creating an, an, a vision for what your ideal society is. Huh. And doing that like through the arts is a lot more effective than people <laughs> talking about politics because people just see this image and it really appeals to them. They see – and I'm not just talking about erotically, just the whole aesthetic of it. It can be maybe to you it's a padalero. Yeah. But they just think I this is the kind of society I, I envision. Yes. It's like the whole rabbit's alt-left aesthetic where if you go to altleft.com, rabbit loves like that space age, bachelor pad, you know, stereo lab, d- baby doo-wop thing and full of whites who can make that happen, right? And that – encompasses a whole philosophy and political ideology with it. And we live in an internet age now where people are saying they could be furries, they can be, you know, living anime characters, they could be some nerd in some video game, some strange culture that happens, the church of euthanasia, right? It's yeah, these- I mean, it's so ironic that this kind of liberalism, which uh, people – Traditionalists say destroyed society. It's it's also given people this freedom to kind of start over and create their own new visions. Yeah, but hopefully everyone is on the same page, right? Do you think the whole sort of uh, Lassa Nielsen, a Will McBride aesthetic it would appeal to a lot of the homosexual, like white nationalist types? You know, it probably does because one, they're all white, and that means they must be promote white culture. It must promote. That's what. The white man does that, and so it's beautiful patriarchy, right? And so I think I, – I don't mean to be degenerate. You know, That's the word – that's the famous word they use on the alt-right, degenerate or Jew. Yeah. There's nothing degenerate when it's the good for society and that there's some healthy values that come with it, right? It, it, it seems to be degenerate when you're not about self-improving and materialistic, right? You're, you're fat. You play Super Smash Bros. You stay at home. You don't care about society, right? There's all that in America, but in America is enabling that behavior because we have too much freedom. And people, who cares if you want to do self improvement? Because whatever. And so to make a healthy nation happen, you got to change the system, and everyone's got to be on the same page. And so when I think about, you know, there are degenerate, like materialistic things, right? So when somebody calls out on me and says that Asian Aryanism is degenerate, Right. No, I mean, basically, a degenerate is someone who just does like they they want to do something. I, there's two types of degeneracy: the kind of people who just devote their lives to just like purely hedonism, or like watching TV or porn, or or even porno- pornography all the time. I mean, I'm not a prude per se, but people that that just all they do are eating junk food and drinking alcohol. And then the other kind of uh, degeneracy is just kind of uh, crass materialism. And that's another with thing is like, the thing about materialism is I love stuff for its aesthetic qualities, but then there's a kind of degeneracy of crass materialism. Like I'm going to buy a certain car to show my status. But the alt-right 
not every, I mean, there's a segment of the alt right. Their definition of degeneracy is basically anything that doesn't fit like their worldview. Yes, and you have to remember that if people do those things, like watch TV and go to the bar, that means they're trying to comprehend or they're trying to um, they're self helping themselves in a society of pain they can't handle. Right? Freud once said that if you smoke cigarettes, you have some homosexual tendencies or something. Huh. Right? <laughs> You, you people do habits because they it's so. Painful. I've also heard people people say like or I've heard people say like skyscrapers are like phallic symbols or that's very yeah. frustrating analysis. Well, I do Asian Arianism as a self help thing to help me with all the pains I've been with. You know, certainly all the Asian girls I've been with and have been struggling with, and as a way for me to comprehend the world. I just want to tell everyone this is how I think things are normal. In no way it's degenerate because I'm for those healthy things. You know, we think degenerate is like the church of euthanasia or some furry club, right? It's just a joke. But as long as you take yourself authentic and serious and you want to contribute in a healthy way, like starting a family, having a job, and contributing to your professional world and on the internet, you can do great things. However, we are living in a time where if you have all this money – you can literally do what you want in liberal New York City, and it's crazy. And I think a lot of people have been doing that. It's sad. I mean, how many times have you seen an IFC documentary about some eccentric artist that does all these things he wants, but is completely oblivious to all classes below him? You know, it's unfortunate because we really live in a class-based society where there's the rich up top, the middle class, the poor, and then just different races. So there is this concept of aristocratic individualism, an aristocratic individualism, it's not just like – it's not libertarianism or anarchism of just sort of uh, everyone doing whatever they want. But it's about these kind of individuals who have their uh, grand visions of their of what a society should be. And it is utopian and it also puts these individuals in conflict with society as it is but – Oh, uh, we've done a number of shows on that topic in the past. Yeah, I mean, we're living through strange times where everyone we're in a mass autistic world where everyone has their unique form of autism and interprets the world in their own light. However, that's where we have the normies, where normies do normie things. And it's considered normie to watch MTV, have promiscuous sex, dr- alcohol, drugs. I don't do any of that stuff. But then normie people, the whole theory of that sex game theory online is basically trying to control normies so they can get – they can manipulate them and get them – here's the thing. It's funny because only white people can be like classified as autistic, right? You never have heard a case with a Mexican, black, or Asian that has quote-unquote – Asperger's. It seems like Asperger's is a unique thing among middle class white Americans where the liberal elite can just say, well, you're a crazy eccentric. You don't even have money. You talking about this fan fiction of video game? I mean, there's the official diagnosis, but it's kind of a term to kind of diagnose anyone who's eccentric, yes. who doesn't, who's a nonconformist. Yeah, and it's it's so silly because the truth of the matter is they never called anyone Asperger's who has a six pack, lift weights, like knows his game, like an indirect salesman who knocks on doors and sells them things. Is that person autistic or is that just a slave in the machine and doing his work, right? As long as you do authority and power, no one has problems with you. Back to uh, Katsei to Kino Uta, but that there's that theme with the normies, but then there's a superintendent of the school telling people – like what you have to do to fit in. But there's also something like it's funny because they're doing it in a very like Japanese voice, like ordering everyone around. Like you're not going to – like someone suggested, let's do music. No, we have to do math. <laughs> well, in Kaze Toki no Uta, there's the, the blonde-haired uh, school instructor who, who has some appearances. She's like this very pretty – Oh, yeah. She's woman. very tall and – She's dressed kind of like – almost like a dominatrix kind of. Yep, and she tells all the boys to do things and she has the upper hand. And for the, the thing in the school environment, the school system is so terrible in America. 
America. It's poorly educated. It's basically now just a cesspool of blacks and Mexicans and other non-whites, and all the whites got to go to private schools to escape that mess. And so it's sad is because the schools are not tr- – you can't trust a, a school anymore, right? They just want you indoctrinated. They don't even care. It's a psycho – it's a psychosocial institution, like that one psychologist, Eric Erickson, right? I think you've written about that in your blog. About Yes. Eric Erickson is a psychologist. He's known for his theories on identity crisis and the psychosocial narrative. Basically, like Ken's Maslow's Pyramid, we go through life asking questions, and institutions form those things for us. We don't really have a say as an independent person. There's an institution that wants to mold us and say, this is the narrative of life. At the same time, we develop um, diagnoses and um, problems if we don't answer certain vital questions. Say I'm 19 years old and it's time for me to have sex, but I don't have any women to have sex with and I just see a bunch of guys. Therefore, are you gay or it's delayed? And so life is moving rapidly and we must answer these questions before we die. And so the institution has catered those psychosocial values within the system. I do want to comment on the aesthetic of Akatsuki to Kino Uta. We touched on it briefly in our Padalero show. It does have that kind of Art Nouveau style. But uh, Padalero is a lot more colorful. I'd say Akatsuki uh, to Kino Uta is a darker aesthetic, but there are scenes... It does have has aspects of a kind of Art Nouveau, but also... The kind of traditional European aesthetic from like the 18th century, but with the Japanese interpretation of that. And it takes place uh, in uh, France. And there's a lot of beautiful scenes. Like you have the architecture of the boarding school. You have like the fr- – I think it takes place in the city of Arles in France in the late 19th century. And then there's the scene where they're running through the forest. I mean, it's a very beautiful film, aesthetically. Yeah, I mean, for Takemiya, there's always been this fascination, especially with the old um, Sojo manga, just to interpret it Western authority and Western visions of the world. Other mangas, like uh, Candy Candy, is also known for this, too. There's also the scenes uh, from the church and their interpretation of Christianity and Catholicism. Yes. I mean, if you replace all the European people but make it with Japanese with blonde and brown hair. Somehow this is the ultimate Confucius society where Japanese deserve to be at this authoritative position because they like that. There's a lot of huge Western fascination in Japan that's completely under work. And I definitely say it's a play on Asian Aryanism, certainly. And um, anything with that is uh, a Western love for that as well. And that's what Takemiya is coming from that tradition. However... For Minio Maya, he comes from an esoteric and more artsy tradition of just looking up queer and eccentric works of the Art Nouveau and Harry Clark style of art, the H.P. Lovecraft, and a lot of stringed and edgy styles. Yeah, Padalero is a total uh, fantasy world. Uh, Kase Tu Kino Uta is a very... It has a fantasy aesthetic, like especially that scene towards the end where they're floating in space, and you see, I think is it like kind of snowballs floating down or use, or water droplets coming down, very surreal. But for the most part, I'd say it is kind of an interpretation of what France was like in the, the eight, 19th century. It's as if Japanese reader wish they can escape their mundane life in Tokyo and could live somewhere in France instead because it's much more beautiful and like a fairy tale land. And so there is that loving fascination of Japanese wishing they were white, which is really funny in a way. Pillator, there was also this manga in Japan, Okana Ganai, and that was one of the most uh, controversial uh, yaois. Uh, can you talk about that one? Sure, uh, Okana Ganai. That I actually seen that one uh, two years ago um, by accident. I uh, I found it out about in my own anime club, and it seems to be very popular among uh, nerdy girls. Or it, it's strange because it's about. Um, a younger, uh, a young boy who can't get any money to go into college, and so this young boy that looks like a girl is then sold to this prostitution rank, and then some kind of, um, I do believe some uh, millionaire agent buys him and just uses him to rape him, and then 
every time he buys him, the prostitute will pay off his money for his freedom and for his college. At the same time, however, there is this pedophilia romance in uh, No Money. And yet, in the in the Japanese audience, it seems to be that it's, it's a loving romance. But in, according to the West, we think that's just creepy, and it's plain like... Um, rape you know some yeah, older it's guy. also interesting that it's caters to a female audience because if that was created in america like you would think stereotypically it would cater to like older uh, homosexual men yes there's another character in it too um who's a cross-dresser and who acts as kind of this uh clerk or something it's a guy that dresses up as a woman he's one of my favorite characters the same manga artist also wrote a spin-off with the uh cross-dresser character in his own uh, loving, where he falls in love with, I think, with this uh, half-white, half-Japanese uh, Yankee well, character. I'm looking at the imagery. The main character actually has blonde uh, hair. Yeah, that's the boy. And then you have the uh, older guy, um, who is, uh, like, the, the, the millionaire kind of guy. The Yaoi has that aesthetic where they look like women, but with men's body. And they don't... They kind of have that Japanese look, but... Um, I think their names were um, uh, Yukia and, uh, or no, no, Yase, I think it was, um, Yase. I think those were the names, if I'm trying to remember from the anime, but, um, and then uh, the businessman is, um, um, I think, Kanau or uh, something like that. But um, it's just weird that there's that, um, the balance between the two. The same artist, the manga artist, uh, the uh, manga artist, uh, Toru uh, Kuosaka, also did some yaois based upon uh, Nazi imagery. Um, I remember looking this up where it's men in Nazi uniforms and they they like each other, but it's it's the same thing. Like no money, it's this uh, sexual love for one another, and it's 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 a borderline uh, offense stuff. You know, you don't know where this is coming from, either a fetish or actually a girls thing. And you have to. Oh, think- and this is actually. I think this came out in the nineties, so this is. Uh- significantly newer than the other ones. Are you talking about uh, Hitoyo Shinozaki? Um, or, the I, illustrator, or the illustrator Toru Yeah, uh, yeah the, I'm talking about uh, the, the illustrator. The, the creator just does no money. I think they both work together. And they both have blogs. I think they're both the, the... I think it's a pen name, too. They're both yaoi lovers, and I remember doing some... Um, oh, yeah, I see the, I see the Nazi one. <laughs> yeah, uh, Kuosaka is more going to be on the Nazi imagery, but it's then again, at the same time, however, it's, um, this love, girls read it, right? Hardly will any, uh, men read it and stuff. But I really like the, um, oh, there was this, um... But it, the Nazis look like a happens. <laughs> yes, that's what I was saying. It's um, as if, uh... Germany and Japan won the war and, like, intermarried and created, like, these new Asian Nazi race. Yes, yes. I always kind of fantasize about that myself, too. <laughs> There's the one character. Oh, I finally got his name. Uh, Shinobu uh, Somiya. Somiya has his own uh, spin-off manga by the same... He's a character in No Money, but he's a, he's a cross-dresser that looks like a woman. But there's its own manga where he falls in love with this white, Yankee, muscular dude presented in the... And it's kind of this gay thing where it's like one guy's really masculine and Somia is more like the twink or like the girl character. So what's interesting about uh, uh, the poem of the wind in the trees is Gilbert is more effeminate, but at the same time, he's also a dominant. (laughs) Yeah, it's, um, that's the thing. It's like, there are girl characters. I guess the, the term for that is like a power bottom. Yeah, and then there's muscular guys who are like, they, they're like Jack Donovan, lift weights, and they want to huh. be the man, right? Compared to, if you just want to be the girl, and you're really feminine. And it's, it's almost like a hetero relationship, but hide it under the disguise of, you know, cross-dressing and being gay. But I really like this uh, Sumia, uh, Sumia character. Um, it's almost, he can pass as a woman. And it's funny, too, in the manga, at night, he is like this prostitute, cross-dressing, sexy, cosplaying uh, Lolita character that flirts with all the men. And in daytime, he's like a normal, nerdy-looking uh, beta uh, male lawyer. And both forms are really sexy. And it comes off as like he has dual personality types. And he's always wishing, why can't he be 
both himself at the same time. It's interesting. It's uh, I don't want to spoil the that spin-off manga, but you'll learn more about it if you read uh, Okono Gainai and um, some of his other um, the other works of um, uh, Shinazaki and Kuasaka. We are at the end of the show. Uh, Pill Eater, is there anything else you'd like to uh, add about Katsei Tuni Tukino Uta that I I didn't touch upon? Well, it's it's certainly a very interesting film, and I, I made a 40-minute documentary about it when I was sick, and I was coughing at it, and just tried to get that out there. And maybe I'll do more documentaries, and maybe I should do a slideshow about Patelio, and maybe cover these things like the uh, amazing panda adventure, and talk about maybe the uh, white male, Asian female relation in that, too. I also love the Karate Kid part, too, and maybe should be discussing about that further. There's certainly a lot of things in these films, especially these eccentric art films, but uh, fil- films like these are very eccentric, and they, they, they come from the East, and they also come from... Uh, there's also a Western interest in this fascination with the male figure, and it, it's something that needs to be unlocked, and it has to have a certain intellect to understand it, and a certain appreciation for different aesthetics. And I think, um, uh, you know, that's that's why I really like uh, Kaze Tiki no Uta, is that it, it's definitely a love story, and anybody can relate to it, even if you are heterosexual. It seems to me that the, it's a past and time, an unbelievable thing that has happened in your life, and really only you can tell this to other people, you know. None of this is recorded. So you have to be, um, it's, it's a tale that you could tell people. And it's certainly aesthetic to live by as well. To imagine Japanese role-playing in European figures definitely remind me of a certain Asian-Aryan aesthetic, you know. We're at the end of the show. Uh, Pillator, uh, thanks for being on. It's been an excellent show. Thank you, Robert Stark, so much.